In this series, I'm going to make portraits to reveal some truths about who we are. In the work I make and the way I live my life, I'm interested in identity, in what's behind the masks we wear. Ready? Yeah. And I'll try and capture the real Ryland. <laughs> God forbid. Portraits are some of the greatest art in history, and they're a scary challenge for an artist. You're part psychologist and part detective. You hunt for clues to the inner life, then everything you've seen, you distill, and one single image is all you get. But get it right, and that image tells you something a thousand selfies never could. Our most beautiful and complex artwork that we can make is our identity. When they're finished, I'll be allowed to place my portraits in the Holy Temple of British Portraiture, the National Portrait Gallery in London. But the people I've chosen aren't these polished heroes of British history. Most of the people in this gallery are white, middle-aged, heterosexual, as far as we know, men. And uh, I'm doing something, I suppose, quite cheeky. There's me, the oik with a bit of a chip on his shoulder, bringing a parade of the unusual and the troubled in amongst these seemingly impervious icons of British solidity. My portrait subjects are people who are experiencing some of the extremes of modern life. They're at a crossroads or a crisis in their identity. I've chosen them because I think they'll help us all to answer what might be the oldest question ever posed. In this programme, I'm going to make portraits of groups. We like to think we're individuals, that we're modern and independent, but scratch the surface and we're still shaped by the tribes we live in. One tribe I've chosen is bound together by something as basic as their bulk. I understand why strangers feel no, the need to say it. You're sad! Yeah, I know, I buy my clothes. Another is so united by their disability that they're happy it's something their children will share. Then we were texting all our friends. I said, our baby's deaf, and we just got loads of congratulations. But for my first portrait about group identity in Britain, I chose a group who are expressing their Britishness in the most hardcore way I could think of. I'm starting this journey in a city where the sense of belonging to a tribe is written in art on the walls. Belfast feels dominated by portraits and they pack a punch it's impossible to ignore. Making a series about portraiture and identity, really, you couldn't come to a place where it's more visible than here in Belfast. What we have here is a much more manifest visual representation of the kind of identity issues that we all have. But here, they're very obvious. They're all in the street. They line the road. You're very, you're very aware of the sort of person that's living in a sort of house. I mean, when, when you walk around a normal town in Britain, one of the things you often think is, I wonder who lives here and what they do. Here, you know. I've come to meet a group of loyalists from the Newtonards Road in the heart of Protestant East Belfast. It was the centenary of the Ulster Volunteer Force, a paramilitary organisation which went on to commit hundreds of murders, but which has now renounced violence. The local community was going to turn out for a parade to mark the day. To make my portraits, I first need to observe and understand my subjects at times when their identity is on show. I got a sense of just how strongly locals feel about identity when I met grandmas Roberta and Jean. So, Jean, you're a mother of eight and a grandma. 
and what you're about to do is it, it's quite a hardcore thing to do what you know have a tattoo on like that isn't it some people wear their heart in their sleeve i'm more moon and jack on man and it's just all about freedom of expression maybe it might be frowned upon a woman of my mature years even contemplating doing it but i feel so strongly and then anybody that sees me is under no illusion of what I'm about or who about, just the, these symbols. What my, I have no identity crisis. You don't have one? No, I don't have an identity crisis. You're very I, sure. I'm quite, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm 100% sure. I'm 100% sure. sure. And you see it on that, really, Ben. That's my official stamp, Grayson. <laughs> She's British, and that's all about it. There's no doubt Branded. in it. <laughs> yeah. Art on the body, art on the walls. But for my artwork, I needed to know why. And I started to understand the feelings that lay behind it all when I met Alec. Yeah, what does Britishness mean to you? If you were born a Protestant, you were British. If you were born a Catholic, Catholics would have put themselves in the nationalist or Republican. And it's just the way it was separated identities. I wasn't brought up with Catholic. Yeah. I thought a Catholic was, had a, a different colour. Also, Grayson, I couldn't read and write. I, I was illiterate. Alec collects prison memorabilia made by loyalist prisoners in the maze. His collection told a story of an identity forged in isolation, ignorance and fear. That was made in the East Block. Wow, that's quite an artefact. There was people who went into prison who were in poverty. He, he loved it. The, they loved the prison regime because they get fed and, and the warmth. But it, what they didn't have on the outside. Do you think it was a tragedy for all sides? Yes, uh, I really do. They were working class men. Many of the prisoners in the maze committed appalling crimes, but something about this object spoke to me. It wasn't just that it proclaimed Alec's allegiance. It made me wonder what British identity was. I came here feeling quite ambivalent about the whole situation in Belfast, having watched it all on television you know, throughout my life, pretty much. But meeting the people here, I have, you know, I, I'm beginning to develop quite an empathy for the situation and, and not taking sides, but just realising that if you grow up and you haven't got many opportunities and you're presented with this rich culture that's very involving and it's reinforced on a daily basis by the people you meet, the places you go and the places you can't go, that this, this engenders in someone uh, a cultural identity which is so deep and so passionate that they are willing to commit heinous acts for it. And it's only when th those feelings that you've grown up with and developed and your, your, your strong sense of identity are under threat that, you, that the people realise you know, how much they mean. We, the rest of us, we live in, thankfully, uh, you know, tolerant, multicultural Britain. But could my portrait subjects ever reinvent themselves so they weren't so defined by their past? Johnny was leading one of the marching bands in the parade. The band seems all about British identity. It's all about almost militaristic style, the British militaristic style. A lot of the imagery I see around here is pretty militaristic and quite kind of aggressive. A lot of it is sort of saying, keep out, says to me. Is that, is that deliberate, you think? Most of those murals are starting to disappear now. Um, and what they're trying to do is really take away that sort of aggressive side to it, have a more historical look at it, where we need to keep some of these murals because it is part of our past. What I've seen time and time again talking about identities, people are looking for, they're looking for something that's certain. You know, that seems to be the thing, is that we're all lost souls. Yes. And we're all trying to find our place where we feel home. Yes. And does that really be true? That's the, the, honestly the best way to put it, you know. Um, simple things like in East Belfast, I'm from East Belfast, I'm very proud to be from East Belfast. So whenever I was living away, 
every time I came home and the plane was descending back into Belfast airport, the first thing I looked out for was the cranes at the shipyard because that for me was home. And it was the same when I lived away and I missed the parades. My dad would phone me and go listen and let me hear the music of the parades. And, and just you just do get that sense of that's home. The neighbourhood was gathering for the march. It was an event produced by conflict and a history of violence on both sides. But there was no denying its spectacular side. Well, here we are. We're at the parade to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the forming of the UVF. And uh, it's like nothing else you'll see in anywhere else in Britain. This is passion. It's exotic. I was surrounded by a mass expression of identity. Now I had to make my own portrait of this community that said something different about where that identity might lead. I was in Belfast at the parade to mark the 100th anniversary of the Ulster Volunteer Force and it was making me question what British identity meant to me. people are more British than the British. We are kind of shocked because to be strong and fervent about one's national identity is somehow not British. Here, people are very, very sure about what their identity is and there is, I can understand, a comfort in that certainty. Of course, the downside has been that in that opposition that in some ways has helped them define their identity, there has also been, of course, conflict. And maybe the dilemma now going forward is to think about how they continue with that strong sense of communal identity and culture and tradition without it antagonising the opposition and it to be a standalone, peaceful celebration of who they are. Parade marched to Craigavon House, semi-derelict now, but once the seat of the Ulster Parliament. It seemed a resonant place for this group to sit for the sketches I always like to make. This display of group identity bound their community together. But did the Loyalists have a clue how far they still had to travel if they were going to be embraced by the Britain they were so loyal to? Your very patriotism and loyalty is, some, is in some ways in, curiously un-British. It may be the loyalists here in Northern Ireland are seen as almost like very old-fashioned. It is, like you say, a very old-fashioned sort of traditionalist ideal that people from Northern Ireland have. People feel they have a, a point to prove and that there's a shortfall to make up there. They're more inclined to fly a union flag outside their house than mm -hmm. someone's So do you, when is. you look at the sort of attitudes of people on the mainland sometimes, do you think that they don't know they're born a bit and they, they, they should be a bit more loyal to Britain? Or I think Britain? they have it easy because they don't really have to fight for their Britishness as yes. such. We're so caught up in our own wee world here. We're mm. almost caught in our wee Northern Ireland loyalist bubble the yeah. Yeah. and we don't even appreciate half of what's going on in the rest of mainland Britain. That's true. Do you know, we don't even know half of what's oh. going on because we're so fixated by ourselves oh. um, and just the fact that someone maybe from mainland Britain has come to take a wee interest in us, we're yeah. actually just so delighted by that yeah. actually. Yeah. Yeah. So we are. The Newtonards Road is group identity in its rawest form. The inheritance they shared from geography, ethnicity, and blood. But in the Britain I'm loyal to, identity isn't really like that. And that's the tension I wanted my portrait to explore. I think
think the aesthetic of loyalism is quite dour. I got a feeling that you know they felt very hard done by and that their image was quite grim. And so I wanted to make something that was quite jolly and um, almost a little bit sort of glitzy. And so I'm doing this computerized embroidery banner that I hope will have maybe a few sequins on it as well. Of course, one of the, the recurring images of the Loyalist murals is Prince Billy on his horse. So my horse is sort of jolly, but he's also looking a bit knackered. Because I wanted to um, give what is quite an austere message in some ways, and, and a message that is rooted in a vision of Britain that perhaps doesn't completely gel with the modern 21st century idea of Britain that we have nowadays. If they want to remain loyal to it, they've got to move on too, and it's all about uh, embracing a kind of uh, what Britain stands for today as much as what Britain stood for in maybe like the 1950s. Groups like the Loyalists we're born into, but some groups we actively seek out. And for my next portrait, I found a group who feel like they're taking their first steps in a struggle for acceptance that every oppressed identity from suffragettes to civil rights, has had to fight. When I went in and was like, oh my God, I, did, I mean, I had no idea this existed. It was something that I'd never experienced before. I would really like a carnival day right. where women like us mm. can actually show how proud we are. Is your identity something you're just stuck with, or can you reinvent it so you feel better about yourself? I'd plunged into the world of the BBWs, big, beautiful women, and those were the questions bouncing around my head. a nice country house in Somerset with uh, a group of about 50 larger women and uh, they're all going to be contestants in Miss Plus Size International which is a pageant which is held later in the year. It seems to be in many ways that fat people are the last taboo. People still feel able to mock them and uh, say a lot of very negative things about them so uh, under that onslaught I'm wondering whether they can transform this into an identity in which people can take pride. For many of the women I was meeting, BBW boot camp was the first time in their lives that they were seeing any kind of positive identity reflected back. But could they really turn around in a single weekend the lifetime of negative images they carried around? How much do you think, you know, of the kind of the downside of being big you carry in yourself and how much of it is in other people? When you're constantly told, and I very often do get heckled, fat, she's fat, look at the fat heifer walking down the road. And I it's, don't it's, understand why strangers feel no, the need to say, is. you're it's fat. So yeah, I know, I buy my clothes. No, like, <laughs> I used to look at myself in the mirror and think I was just plain ugly, like disgusting. I was just, mm -mm. So, I don't know, I just changed something in me. I was just like, no, do you know what, actually? I am actually really beautiful. Mm. If you have confidence, whatever they say, it shouldn't even affect you at all. I think that's right, because I think any kind of acceptance is co-created. The example I always use, because I'm a transvestite, and I used to see other transvestites, and they used to complain to me, oh, I got treated really badly in this shop. You know, and I say, well, how did you behave, though? I said, did you skulk and look guilty? <laughs> Which is what they always do, they always skulk and look guilty, you know. And so, once you sort of say, if you just go in and say, have you got this in my size, they go, oh, you know, they, the, the shop assistants go, oh, we've had a tranny in today. He was great. He was really nice, like this. Yeah. As a group, our, our power is we're all singing from the same hymn sheet yes. and we're all championing yeah. that plus size course. isn't a dirty word. Hold hands, girls, own it, press, camera, 
Oh, net milk it. Day one was catwalk model training, and it was clear that the visuals for this portrait were going to be a gift. And today is your catwalk training. You are big, beautiful, confident women. So believe it and own it. It's not to be taken lightly. I will be far from the first artist to want to depict the statuesque woman. The impulse goes right back to the very beginnings of art itself. I think what we're seeing is that our identity is a process. It's not a fixed thing that we're given at birth. It's something that is constantly evolving. It's, it's, it's our perhaps our most beautiful and complex artwork that we can make is our identity. BBWs, Sarah, Georgina and Melanie volunteered to pose for me. Three graces, standing that bit taller than they had the week before. What's been the most powerful thing that's happened to you on this weekend, or, you know, a, a coming here? It was like being an only child. <laughs> and then walking in to find out that your father had made all these children and they all had similar feelings to you. And you just felt, oh my God, I'm no longer on my own. For me, it's like coming home. It's changed my life in so many ways to be so accepted. And if I can do that to other people, you know, to make them feel that they they are beautiful, you know, just the way they are. Everybody here, when we leave today, we are going to be so emotional because it's, we've, it's just, I, I don't even know the words. It's just, it's, it's the most amazing experience I've ever been on in my life. It really has. Being around these girls, they seem to be making a choice, really. They've all tried dieting and failed, so they've opted for mental health. And they're saying, I'm proud to be big and I've got confidence. And it seems, you know, to be transforming their attitude to how they are. So I'm kind of mellow into this idea that maybe, you know, on the kind of the journey that many different identity issues have been making from kind of being a problem to being something that people are proud of and is defining and is a sort of rallying point for a group. Fatness is on that journey in the same way as gayness was decades ago. Being a woman was a century ago. And as I started to see the BBWs that way, I realised what this weekend really was. <laughs> it was a mass coming out I was experiencing, and I couldn't stop myself being swept along. people that I've made friends with here and I will continue to be friends with them, whether they like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> I think being around all of you girls, because we've got so much in common and we've shared all the same worries and all the same insecurities, I've shared some secrets with these girls. I haven't even shared with people from home. Yeah. You just yeah, feel so much closer agree. and connected. Yeah. So connected. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's a powerful thing, a group. And for my portrait of this very modern group identity, it was to that most ancient image of a woman's body that I turned. The first image I thought of when I thought of the big women was they're like the Will and Dor Venus, a kind of like absolutely primal, fecund, fertility goddess sort of thing. And then I was thinking about all the different sort of the swirling, contrary images we're given about flesh in our society. So um, 
I've, 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 I've made her dress like a kind of collage of all the sort of things over the centuries that have kind of either suppressed or celebrated the, a woman's curves. And, and the imagery I'm using uh, to decorate the dresses of these Venuses reflects my own ambiguous feelings around it. I can see these women as beautiful, but I'm sort of also thinking the health issue, of course, is the one, you know, the, the, the women we talk to, they seem to be um, a little bit in denial of the, you know, the absolutely plain negative aspects of being very, very fat. I mean, an interesting thing about being on that weekend with these women was that it's sometimes nice to sort of delve back through the kind of floating, intermingling network of images that make up our identity and to unpick it and say, is this working for us? And I think that's what these women did in a way. They've, they've, they've gone on this weekend and they're saying, I've been carrying around this bad image and I, I need to shrug it off because I'm not going to shrug the way off. Whether it'll work or not, I don't know, because these things uh, are not just created by the people within the group, they're also by, created by the people looking at the group, the, the people outside of it, because um, you know, one can declare an identity until uh, the cows come home, but um, if people go, yeah, right, it's not going to work. In making my artworks for the National Portrait Gallery, I was meeting groups of people who expressed their identity in some surprising and provocative ways. I'd met a tribe so obsessed by their Britishness that it makes them do things that, to me, don't seem that British at all. I'd met a group who were rebranding their bodies into a positive source of group pride. And for my final group portrait, I went to a party in Wembley and entered the parallel world of the death. The hearing world thinks of deafness as a disability and not so long ago as a source of shame. But this group of polite North Londoners were in their own way revolutionaries, reclaiming deafness as a richly rewarding identity in itself. My hosts were theatre director Paula and deaf rights campaigner Tomato. We're misunderstood because people don't believe that a deaf culture actually exists. And we don't, it's not like we all dress up in some kind of uniform. It doesn't mean that we eat the same food. But what we do have is very similar lifestyles. We, we have, language. well, it's language, yes, language. language. And that's, that's the important part of our the culture. The shared experience of oppression. And without sign language, I would be dead. It was language that was central to this identity. And the fact we needed two interpreters to communicate brought home the gulf I'd have to cross to make this portrait true. And it was when Paula and Tomato told me what they wanted for their daughters that I got how differently their deafness made them see the world. So, how did you feel when you found out that your daughters were deaf? We really expected that they would be hearing. We eventually said to the doctor, and we said, OK, fine, we'll have a hearing test. After all the tests... And they said, I'm very sorry, she has a hearing problem. Yeah, that was it. That's how we were told, yeah, they, it's a hearing they problem. They it as a problem. A problem. Yeah, we, we just looked at each other. Yeah, we just smiled. We were really happy. <laughs> we were like, great. And then we were texting all our friends. I said, our baby's deaf. And we just got loads of congratulations. Well done. She's going to be part of your world. Paula and Tomato's eldest daughter, Molly, is profoundly deaf. And that made her parents happy that should always share their world. But they invited me along to the local audiology department, where the exact degree of younger daughter Hazel's deafness was about to be revealed. She's doing very well. What does that mean, she's doing very well? I mean, just accepting her how she is, really. No, I mean, she's doing the test very well. So Hazel's hearing hasn't changed. 
so it didn't deteriorate, which is good. So how, how does it feel, Tomato, to, uh, to talk about Hazel's hearing and, you know, in a medical way like this? I think it's very psychologically abusive because I remember my family's face when I was kind of sitting there and the audiologist said to me, listen very hardly, listen as hard as you can. And I didn't know what it meant to listen hard. Um, so there was this level of expectation on my parents' face. And every time the audiologist clicked on this uh, mechanism, this expectation from my parents, and I'd think, oh my God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let them down. So I, I, I knew that they were pressing something because I saw their arm twitch. So I'd put my hand up and say yes, and my parents would be really happy. So they thought I could hear, but actually I couldn't. I was just looking at the body language of the audiologist when they would, um, or, or I'd have a look at the reflection, or I'd, I'd pick up on clues around me as to what was going on. Understandably, the medical community, they're scientists, they, un they define hearing loss, deafness, as a disability because their job is to help people become medically normal, to, 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 to function in a hearing world. The deaf community, they have to kind of, they operate in a non-hearing world and so they, have, because language is so central to our identity, they have formed a rich, rounded culture that, that is based on sign language and it is their own culture and it is and it's a beautiful thing. And so there is this clash, this, this watershed point. And then Tomato showed me something which summed up the conflict for me. These are Tomato's handmade punk hearing aid covers, which I think are a marvellous cultural artefact because they sort of, they almost embody that transition between kind of a disability and a culture that in a single artefact, because I think somehow in that thing, it's incredible. It says it all. It says, I am deaf and I am proud. It was this mood of spiky group defiance I wanted to capture for my portrait. And when some of Paula and Tomato's friends came round to sit for me, I glimpsed how hardcore in North London, every bit as much as in Northern Ireland, the politics of identity can be. Are Paula and Tomato being sort of militant utopians in kind of hoping for some world which would fit exactly how they want it? I'm really sorry, Grayson, you're hearing, so, you know, I don't mean to offend you, but I feel like we're constantly trying to please hearing people and fit in with what hearing people want. And deaf people have to put up with a really appalling education system because people can't be bothered to learn to sign. So I totally, in that respect, understand where they're coming from. If anything, the militants are the hearing people who want deaf people to only learn how to speak and not acquire a sign language. That's where the extreme beliefs come in. We're, we're ignored all the time. We're neglected. Our language is neglected. Um, so if we can teach you that, how important sign language is, what other things can we teach you? For this group, joining deaf culture has been a liberation. But the more we cleave to one kind of identity, the less room it leaves for anything else. Paula is Jewish as well as deaf, and her mother Rita and stepfather Norman were arriving for a Passover meal. The scene was set for a culture clash, where two identities, each with its own history of victimhood, would collide. Well, we you know we're proud of our Jewishness. I think Paula and Tomato sort of shrug their shoulders about it all. Come in, come in. It's the shame. I know you've got Jewish yeah. friends and you go to the synagogue, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. As a deaf person, I guess yeah. I've got deaf yeah. friends. I have yeah. a deaf social yeah. life. Yeah. I'm, you know, it's deaf my culture. Friend. That's kind of my religion, I guess. Of course, I understand, but we still feel that you should tell your children about it being Jewish and they should have the same as you their have as a child. Their heritage and their background. Mm. 
If you don't that's use it, important. that's your choice. But if you don't know, you can't make a choice. And I know how you feel. You want to keep this chain going and you want to pass it down to my children. But it really has to come from my heart. I don't want to do it just because for the sake of it. We are all the same, really. We are yeah. frail, frail human beings who are frightened of ourselves. Going through ritual for Jewish life is a way of telling your body that everything's OK. The same way that being Jewish helps you through difficult times. I think sign language really helps me to consolidate who I am. I find my strength through my language. I used to be depressed. I was anorexic. Wonderful. You've done so much. Very, very skinny. But if I didn't have any language, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be me. It's just about knowing where I'm from, knowing where I belong. It's my identity. It's about being part of that. And it's about being part of this linguistic group. That's what got me through. I beat depression, I beat anorexia because of the language that I have. It helps me understand the world. It helps me understand myself better. And I love growing up in a Jewish household. I enjoyed it. I really value it. It's beautiful. But I can't pass it on to my children. I can't. Even to some little degree. There's no right or wrong to this argument, but it sums up identity in modern Britain for me. It's a never-ending negotiation between the loyalties we inherit and the ones we choose. All of the portrait subjects I've chosen for my exhibition were living on an identity fault line in some way. How that felt, and what it tells the rest of us, was what I wanted my artworks to capture. And I hope my portraits would ring true for the subjects themselves when they came to see them. No pressure. The opening of my exhibition at the National Portrait Gallery was fast approaching. And my final portrait of a group of deaf North Londoners was coming together. I was using a silkscreen print technique. Paul and Tomato and, and their friends. I mean, the, the thing that initially struck me was how politicised they were and how, as a group, the deaf people were very sort of strident about asserting their identity as a culture. And so in, and the moment of revelation for me in terms of inspiration for their portrait was when Tomato showed me his uh, punk ear, hearing aid covers that he had <laughs> with the little spikes on, I thought, Ooh, I think those, that object, for me, had such sort of resonance of kind of reasserting an identity around something that was seen as a disability. They've almost done the job better than I could do it myself. But it did make me think about that period in, in my life, which I lived through too, which was, of course, punk and new wave. And so I was trying to kind of think of a medium for the portrait that echoed that time. Uh, and of course, the kind of quintessential artifact was probably the silkscreened uh, poster for a band or something like that. I thought there was also, of course, a sort of an irony in it being a format associated with music. Of course, the one thing that deaf people don't really have proper access to. It's so beautifully crafted, it seems a shame, but I suppose what, I was, what I'm hoping for is something that looks more, sort of slightly more agit-prop. So you'd like some sort of mistakes in there, rather than a clean clinical execution? Yeah. Cheaper looking. Cheaper. <laughs> yes, exactly. most powerful moments when I was spending time with Paula and Tomato was when Paula was having that discussion with her mother about the kind of hierarchy in her mind of deafness and Jewishness and I think that it, it brought home to me it's a very powerful and tender and moving moment uh, but it brought brought home to me something perhaps that we all face which is when we're kind of thinking about who we are or maybe not thinking about who we are which is maybe a more important thing is that in our unconscious, is there a kind of sifting of levels and layers of how we present ourselves to the world? What is the headline going to be when we sort of encounter anyone? You know, And Paula, of course, had these very sort of stark choices to make between deafness and Jewishness. And she had made a decision on that one, and, and, and especially when it came to how she was going to bring up her children. And I, so I thought, you know, there was a lovely crystallized moment 
of what is probably going on in all our heads all the time is what is the first thing I want people to know about me and who, out, who I am and then the various layers that kind of come in after that that give us our nuanced identity. But what would my subjects make of the way I'd portrayed them? I was about to find out. I want them to like it and I want them to understand why I've done it in such a way and I don't want to make something bland. So it's been, uh, the sensibilities in the air today are heightened, I feel, not just for me, because I feel the groups I'm dealing with have their issues. First up, Miss Plus Size International contestants, Georgina, Melanie and Sarah. So what do you think people will think about your, your kind of identity group when they see these? There's pride there, yeah. first and foremost. We're proud to be who we are. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's us. I had to sort of be a little bit ambivalent because yes. society is ambivalent. Ab yes, yes. absolutely. That's why I put all the food on there, so you've yeah, got sort of donuts and Fabulous. burgers. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, celery didn't do this. No, yeah. no. But, you know, having said that, you do feel beautiful. We are feminine at the same time. There are so many different angles to us, and you've covered every single one of them. I don't want to get emotional again, but it, it, it is just fabulous. Will be saying stop now. <laughs> Two of the loyalists were unable to make the journey from Belfast, but Alec, Jean, and Jason flew in. Hi, Grayson. Hello. 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 This is it. <laughs> it. It strikes me as something almost like a a poster for a, a pantomime or something. Yeah. I don't know how that makes me feel, as if we're maybe part of this pantomime, but that has its own connotations for me, because it makes me think, uh, was I part of a pantomime? What does that all mean, you know? Is this all just nonsense? It's an interesting interpretation, because, you know, that maybe the Britain that the loyalists are loyal to, is that still there, you know? Because we live in the 21st century now. It, it's like nothing I've seen before, which has described or tried to portray loyalism. Loyalism has almost become a bit of a caricature, possibly in Great Britain, with, with flag protests and parades. And I can just imagine what people in GB think of loyalism and unionism back home. Equally, I felt a bit strange some of your questions because I took it for granted. Yeah that, you know, you should know all about this, you should know why that flag's important, you should know what we're about, and I found it strange that you didn't. As you say, we took it as given, that you would understand and, you know, not query or question. But it says it's just a learning curve, plus... Yeah. Shows we still have a sense of humour too, and can smile and laugh <laughs> a lot. Well, that's good. Regardless. So, Jason, what do you think the people back in Belfast will think of this? I don't know what they'll think of it, but I know what I would hope that they will take from it. We're just like this merry tribe with our flag, and I think our flag makes us content, even though it is tattered. You know, and it, it's, it's tattered for many different reasons, but it still makes us... It still makes us feel safe, I suppose. And you're quite right, I think the symbols of loyalism and unionism and orangeism have always been kind of dark and retrospective. And, and what you've done is you've, you've attempted to flip it on its head here. This is bright, jovial, as I say, pantomime. It's, well, almost, it's, it's, it's looking into the future, almost in the future is kind of unknown because the horse is going somewhere and no one knows where it's going. We're if all, it makes it. We're this merry <laughs> tribe, you know, being led by a leader, you know. Jason, the future's bright. The future's orange, pretty. <laughs> And 
Time for my final group portrait. Paula and Tomato brought along their deaf friends. Oh, oh my God, wow. <laughs> I've done you as a band. <laughs> I think it's beautiful. I really didn't um, expect to feel so much emotion on seeing the portrait. Before I came, I thought, oh, I'll expect a picture of loads of hearing aids dotted all over the place, or hands just waving, uh, not a very positive image. But this is incredible. And I think the word, you've added culture, which is fantastic. And it just means you understand that we're a cultural group, not a disability, so it's really emotive. My legs are shaking. The moment for me was when I saw your hearing aid covers because I wanted to make something that was sort of a little bit angry somehow, like a punk poster. I think it's great. I think you've really taken on a lot of complex issues to do with the deaf community. Um, that would take people, uh, people a long time just to understand. And it's simple, it's accessible, it's visual, and it's punk. I love it. I started this series thinking about the very most basic question, who are you? And next time someone asks you that, I hope you reflect back on what I've been talking about and the people I've been meeting, because they're all behind you. They're all somehow part of who you are. <laughs>